Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello. Well, this week, uh, Joseph could not be with us. He has uh, some things he had to take care of, but we are so thrilled to welcome Kwame Scruggs to the program. I have wanted Kwame on the podcast for a while, and a perfect opportunity presented itself, and he said yes, so I was really thrilled. Kwame Scruggs has over 20 years of experience using myth in the development of male youth and adults. He has a PhD and a master's in mythological studies with an emphasis in depth psychology from Pacifica. He is the founder and director of Alchemy, a really uh, fabulously interesting nonprofit organization in Akron, Ohio. And Alchemy uses mythological stories to engage adolescent youth. In 2012, Alchemy was one of 12 programs to receive the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Awards by the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities the nation's highest honor for after-school and out-of-school programs. And Alchemy was also the backdrop for the feature-length documentary, Finding the Gold Within, which is um, just a wonderful film, and I really recommend watching it if you can get your hands on it. In 2016, Kwame was one of seven recipients awarded the National Guild's Milestone Certificate of Appreciation and one of three to receive the University of Akron's Black Male Summit Legacy Award. In 2013, Pacifica Graduate Institute presented him with the initial Wendy Davy Award for Outstanding Service and Contributions in the Tradition of Soulful Service. And in 2020, the Association of Teaching Artists announced that Kwame was the winner of their Innovation in Teaching Artistry Award. Uh, so we are so thrilled to have you on the podcast and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Kwame, just tell Tell us your story. Tell the listeners your story. <laughs> Obviously a condensed version. <laughs> we have time. Okay. <laughs> My earliest images of childhood. I was born in 58. Earliest images of childhood, sitting there watching a the, uh, black and white TV and seeing uh, we were considered colored back then. Seeing the colored people walk down the street and I saw them being beaten and the dogs being sick on them in the, the water hoses, being beaten by the police. I'm three, I'm three years old, three or four years old, probably about three of them. Nobody's explaining this to me. And so you're trying to put it together yourself as a three or four year old child. And I'm like, wow, all they're doing is walking down the street. And so the, I could tell the difference was because of the color of their skin. Okay. And uh, back then, all the images on TV of people of color. We were slaves, butlers, clowns. So uh, I really internalized. I was less than due to the color of my skin. 
uh, really bought into that. And so, you know, fast forwarding 40 years or whatever, end up going through an African based rice of passage where I was formally initiated in the kind system of life cycle development. And for me, it was like, this initiation, any initiation is going to be a, a symbolic death and a rebirth. That's where I learned, uh, I would say, who I was and my purpose. I'm, I'm going to say really what I learned was my purpose. I, I had no idea <laughs> that I was born <laughs> for a reason, you know. Oh my gosh. Uh, then I just started to take life more seriously. And it was through the African based rites of passage that I got introduced into the work of Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. Uh, so that's when I started reading Jung and started reading Campbell. Then it was Campbell's one sentence. Uh, when you follow your bliss doors open where you thought there'd be no doors. And that one sentence changed my entire life. I worked at Goodyear. I'm from Akron, railroad capital of the world. I worked at Goodyear. I graduated from high school on Thursday. Well, I started working when I was 16. Worked two jobs, 12 hours a day when I was 17. Worked every day after school when I was 18. I graduated from high school on a Thursday, started at Goodyear that following Monday in the mailroom. And ended up working a good year, 15 years, and went to school in the evening. So it took me 15 years to get my degree. So I was on, in 91, I left good year. I was on move to New York City, and then the recession hit, so I didn't. Ended up getting a graduate assistantship. Didn't even know what a graduate assistantship was, but I took it because I needed a job. Then ended up getting a job at the University of Akron with Upper Bound Program. And that's around the same time I went through the Rites of Passage and got introduced to the work of Jung and Campbell. I was standing in my office looking out my window, 38 years old, and I remember Campbell's sentence, and I'm like, wow, what is my bliss? And I asked myself, what did I want to do? Not what could I do, what did I want to do? Mm. And prior to that, I, I was reading uh, Meads, uh, Men in the Water of Life, and so I was working with youth and adults running groups, and it was like pulling teeth, getting them to talk. And I, I remember from reading Meads' book, you know, he tell a myth, give his interpretation of the myth. And that just helped me to understand so much about my life. And uh, so then I started using myth, you know, with the youth and adults in my workshops. And so going back to Campbell's question, I, I remember staring out my window. I had a cool job at Akron U. And I asked myself, what is my bliss? What do I want to do? Not what could I do? And my exact words were play my drum and tell mythological stories. And uh, the Internet had just come out. So I'd ask the secretary to see if she could find me a school that offered a Ph.D. because I knew I would need, you know, credentials, you know, to start something like that. So she couldn't find anything. Like I said, the Internet just came out and uh, she found a Ph.D. in folklore or Ohio State and she found some place somewhere else. I didn't want to go. Then months later, months later, I kind of gave it up hope. Months later, a friend of mine came into my office and he threw the magazine common boundaries on my desk and his exact words were Kwame has some interesting ads and articles in here. I'm flipping through it and see Pacifica Graduate Institute. Long damn story. So then I'm going to Pacifica. I, I mean, I, I took me about a year or so to make up my mind, but I just paid attention to my dreams and different synchronistic events. And it was just like, you know, just kept getting signs that, you know, I mean, what signs you want that this is where you need to go, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, finally said the heck with it and and, and went. And uh, back then, so you're talking 97. That was 97 when I first started Pacifica. Uh, you know, people are like, what you going to do with the degree in mythology? <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so then, I, uh, long story short, in the right place, right time, I, I left my job at Akron U and uh, started getting contracts to go into charter schools in Akron and Cleveland running my groups using myth. And then um, having to be in the right place at the right time at Perkins Middle School in Akron, Ohio. And all I was supposed to be doing is taking the attendance and tardies. And I had asked the, the director, could I start running groups? So I ended up running five groups in the school, three for boys and two for girls. Well, they just happened to get this $5 million after school grant from the uh, John James L. Knight wow. Foundation. So the following year, I got my nonprofit and started started Alchemy. And uh, I was just supposed to be a three year project and end up getting some other money. So I ended up keeping those youth, the ones you saw in the film, I ended up keeping them, you know, sixth grade mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. through 12th. And that's how Alchemy started. So we um, 
but we're in our 17th year now. Wow. Wow. So that's how it started. But, you know, this whole, <laughs> before we start recording, you asked about uh, the men's group. Oh, yeah. Please tell us about the men's group. Generally speaking, generally speaking, men, we tend to act like everything is okay when it's really not. And uh, the first myth, the very first myth we do with the sixth graders uh, is the water of life. And, And as I was saying, the reason why we do it is because in the beginning, the king is sick. He has three sons. And when the king is sick, the entire village is sick. And three sons sitting on the castle steps and they're crying because their father, the king is sick. And uh, this old man walks by and because he sees them crying, he stops and he asks them what's wrong. So from that portion in the myth, because you know, we'll tell a portion of the myth, beat of a drum, stop, ask what resonates with him, no right or wrong answers. And I have questions for each portion of the myth. So from that part right there, we just talk about if if you were sitting on, if those boys would have been sitting on the castle steps, acting like everything was fine and that old man would just walk by, but it's because they're crying that it's a sign that something's wrong. So it's, you know, just to talk about the importance of letting somebody know that something's wrong so so people can reach out and try to help uh, or assist. And then then a little further into the myth, when the, when the old man tells them that he knows we're curious, water might be something difficult to get to. First two brothers, oldest two brothers, think that if they secure the water of life, they'll become their father's favorite and inherit the kingdom. And they and they 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 run. They ask the father, "Can they go?" Blah 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 blah. And uh, you know, first he says, "No, it's too dangerous." But then he relinquishes, as some fathers do, mount their horse, you know, one by one. But the dwarf asks him, "Where are you going in such a hurry?" And they're rude to the dwarf. The dwarf doesn't take kind of that, and he casts a magic spell on the oldest son. And the same thing happened to the second oldest son. The youngest son, who we always said our youth, who was just about your age, just about <laughs> your age. Oh, that's great. <laughs> he uh, he doesn't think anything about becoming his father's favorite or inheriting the kingdom. He just wants his father to become well. So he mounts his horse, and we dwarf sees him. He said, "Where are you going in such a hurry?" And man, I I stopped playing the drum. I'll stop playing it. And I, and I say, he gets off of his horse and he admits that he does not know where he's going. Then I go back to the drum beat. And uh, we just talk about the importance of uh, getting off your horse and admitting when you don't know where you're going. And from that point, the dwarf gives him practically everything he needs. So so you were asking what were the ages of the, the group session we got coming up? Like I said, for 18 to, to 85 or 90, however old, because we're just trying to get them. Uh, I think the earlier that men can become comfortable talking about what's really happening, the better off they'll be. We use a lot of quotes. We use a lot of quotes. And one of the first quotes we use is that uh, he who conceals his disease cannot expect to be cured. Mm-hmm. So, it's, so it's all, you know, our method is all about talking about life through myth. So tell us more, because I wanted to have you on in part because I wanted you to get a chance to talk about this men's group that you're going to be offering. It starts uh, It starts in February. February and, 6th. Yeah. Okay, yeah. February 6th. And it's a group for all men, Kwame? All men, and it, it, men. And it's online, right? All, all men, yes. Salome, through our Salome Institute of Jungian Studies. Okay. Yes, online. So before, be, we'll run four sessions, 90 minutes each. Uh, okay. 90 minutes each. Uh, we're going uh, to work through a myth. I'm not telling what myth we're going to do just yet because uh, I don't want people running out to read the myth because it's just it. when you're doing it spontaneously and then it's a little more engaging. And so the process is, if if I can can share, because I we brought Kwame to Philadelphia back some number of years ago, and I was lucky enough to be in one of these processes with Kwame, and it was just remarkable. So Kwame, there's a circle, you're gathered around a circle, and Kwame's playing the drum, and as he explained, he's telling the myth, and then he stops and he asks questions, and you're just supposed to write down kind of the first thing that comes to you. And what happened over the course of the evening, I, I'm a little bit um, at a loss for words because it was really kind of magical, but it was a big group. It must have been 30 or 40 people, but somehow there began to be this kind of mysterious coherence where it felt like there was a, a 
group consciousness that was sort of larger than any of our individual consciousnesses. And, and somehow what one person would say would just knit in so tightly with what someone would say later. And then that would ping something in me. It was just, I remember it was, um, Kwame, I think it was the story of the hunter and the snake. Uh, the hunter and the bow constrictor. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, the hunter and the bow constrictor. And, and I remember it had a pretty profound effect on me and uh, had a real significance for me in my process. So, so this is, this is a really special thing and you're, you're going to do this sort of via zoom Correct. for, for men. So that's an amazing opportunity. How, how wonderful that it, can be brought to so many people. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I can see why you don't want people to run out and, and read the myth yeah. because there really is something about just sort of experiencing it live yeah. with you telling yeah. it. You're a wonderful yeah. storyteller. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I'm aware Kwame with um, your use of myth and the drumming and what Lisa was just saying about this big group uh, somehow people pinging off one another. It's such a powerful illustration of what myth is in the psyche. Mm -hmm. And it is a deep, deep riverbed uh, common to all. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different myths in different cultures and variations on the same myths in uh, around the world. So there's something very deep um, in the psyche, the collective unconscious you know, I'm just thinking about how you take people on river trips. We're all on the same river in some way, and of course, we remain ourselves. But uh, what a powerful process it is, and that myth is not just something you read about in books, that it's alive in us, as your work clearly demonstrates. Yeah. You know, we Jungians really appreciate fairy tales and myths and, and, you know, we talk about them as therapeutic. But one of the really remarkable things about your work is that you have really operationalized this idea of myth as medicine. <laughs> And and I had that experience. I mean, you know, everyone who listens to the podcast knows I love fairy tales. <laughs> it was very special uh, to me to be a part of of that process with you, and it was it was deeply affecting. So you know, just reading a fairy tale is wonderful medicine, but experiencing it in this way that you offer is incredibly powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have the specifics for listeners of where they go, how to sign up? Yeah, the uh, uh, the Salome Institute of Jungian Studies. We can put this all in the show notes too. But but um, Kwame, just like t tell us a little bit more. Is is this for all men, or uh, like who who is this meant for? Who would benefit from it? Oh man, oh, man. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> for a lot know. of people, I hope you got a, a big Zoom account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, here again, this is it's. I say all men because you know Deb saying it's archetypal. It's archetypal. It's like you know, like people going to church. A pastor was talking to me today. Well, the pastor was just talking about some archetypal, and it happened to touch on you like, uh, you know, like I say rain does not fall on one roof alone so it's all men uh, and I think you know as I was saying uh, when I work with our youth in middle school and high school I like you know we get them sixth grade keep them to graduate from high school but you know I often tell them that they're not going to really value what we're talking about right now but uh, once they get 25, 26 years old, they'll be able to reflect and say, hey, you just look at your journal, blah, blah, blah. And it's just amazing how many of them come back and just, you know, man, if I just I got a text a couple of weeks ago. One of the uh, students who's 26 now, he's like Kwame. He said, this works. It really works. Yeah. <laughs> but, but basically, uh, I say all men because... Um, it gets you to thinking the method is designed to have you go deeper, you know, inside. And it's the simplicity of it. It's the simplicity mm -hmm. of it. And mm -hmm. also, like you're saying, it's listening to what others mm -hmm. are saying to, you know, life is so much about making decisions, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. generally speaking, the more information you have on a decision, the better decision you're going to make. So 
And wow, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years into this now, but it wasn't until about four years ago, one of the primary pieces of gold in this process has to do with listening to what other people say. Okay, mm. Diane Scaft in her book, uh, Oracles, uh, I think that's the title. Uh, she talks about a clendon, and a clendon is uh, is that the Greeks had a word clendon, and it's, it's, it's like when someone says something in a conversation that has nothing to do with you, but you, let's say you're walking by them and they and they are talking about something else, it's irrelevant, but it is it, it is speaking directly to you, but it's yeah. it's it's just it's, it's called a clendon. Okay. That's great. Yeah. So, so like, man, just really focus on them listening to what everybody says and giving their rationale, because like a lot of times in the myth, you have to make a decision. And wow, what's so cool in our, in our group sessions, because they sit in the circle of youngest, the oldest, and to hear, to hear someone, uh, to hear someone give their rationale or why they're going to do something. And then later on, another student to give his rationale to the same scenario and then to have one of our youth change their mind based on the information that they receive. That is, that is a gold moment because it just shows your ability to, you know, let your ego go and, and do what you think is best based on the information that you have. Okay. Yeah. I want to go back to something that you said before. I, I find this really remarkable that you, uh, you know, you, you had this, you went through this um, process of initiation and you said that's that's when you understood the purpose of your life. Yeah, yeah. Uh. <laughs> and I, I think that's just, you know, first of all, I do think that that is one of the things that happens when we go through an initiatory process is that we understand our purpose for being here and everything looks different once that happens. I enjoy working with people in their 20s and and many of them are looking for that sense of what is my purpose here and and you know we don't offer youth a way to initiate and so I think a lot of times youth will seek ways to self initiate and sometimes those ways can be pretty destructive or or ineffective but we do, when we're young, look for a way to, and I think these are Mike, Michael Mead's words, throw ourselves into the fires of life. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. And not so just when we are. Uh, not yeah, just not when just we, we are. Young. <laughs> no, I think that's true, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's interesting because I was I was doing the right thing. as I Because, I mean, I was working, going to school in the evening, so I was doing the right thing, but I didn't know for what reason. I didn't know for what reason. I was just going through the motions. And then basically the way it, the way I was introduced to it is or I call it choosing the womb. And it's just, you know, the majority of your cultures believe, and just because the majority of cultures believe this does not make it so, but the majority of cultures believe that, you know, while we're in heaven, our soul knows, you know, soul knows what it needs in order to grow. So, so we choose our geographical location, color of our skin, our parents, and uh, perhaps most importantly, the time of our birth, because we know exactly what we need to grow. Mm -hmm. But it's that nine months in our mother's womb that we forget. Okay, yeah. and then they, they they have different cultures had a tree of forgetfulness. Jewish says, and I think when you when you touch right here, you know, that's when you forget. You know, I extracted wow about eight or different concepts from different uh, religions talking about that concept. So that's when I realized I was born for a purpose, for a reason. And then, and then when I found out what Kwame meant, because my, my legal name is not Kwame, so then I, I legally changed my name to Kwame. Like I say, from reading Jung and just, you know, start reading you, I started reading a lot of Jung because I, cause Lisa, you, you're like one of my heroes. I wanted to be a Jungian analyst, but Back then, back then, you had to have your license in counseling, you know, so, and I, I had a master's in technical education with an emphasis in guides and counseling. So I went back to get my master's in counseling, did all the coursework. All I had to do was my internship in counseling. But at the time, I had been in school 19 years in the evening, and I was like, the hell with this. Okay, so, okay. Uh, and so that's why I went to Pacifica, because it was the closest thing that I could do to become a Jungian analyst. Well, we're still hoping you become an analyst, Kwame. Yeah. <laughs> hey, okay. 
<laughs> I don't know where I'm going to get that time or that energy. But <laughs> you know, I'm so aware of um, how important it is and what you discovered of being connected to something deeper mm-hmm. at age 25. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize that until about 31. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, that that emphasis on that something deeper, so that we are more than just, oh, yeah, um, please. you know, somehow automatons walking on the surface of the earth. That it's that same same kind of theme of what mythology does and the initiatory process that you went through of um, we, we are put here on this earth to be connected and to let something come through us into being on the planet. Yes, yes. And yes. that makes all the difference. It makes yes. all the difference and, in the world. I think so many young people, not just men, but um, women as well, you know, even with all the advent of social media and technology and so on and so forth, it kind of keeps us on the surface of ourselves when uh, the water of life, that myth that you have used, the water of life is is the depths of our soul. And that's where meaning and purpose come from. Yes. Uh, speaking of uh, women, we, whenever I would present somewhere, people would always ask me like four questions. First would be, uh, <laughs> first would be when, you know, how can we get this program in our city? The second would normally be, when are you going to start a program for girls? The third, <laughs> the third and fourth would vacillate. It would, e- would either be, uh, when you're going to write a book or can we add the questions to the myth? So answered all four questions now. Okay. So we started a group for girls like three years, three years ago, we have three women facilitators Four, Great. Amazing. working with this would be their third year, but it'll probably be the last year just because logistics and blah, blah, blah. But we did, we did start a group for girls. And when's the book coming out? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I find an agent, we, we've got a lot of it completed. And, and so. I will say, I, I have read parts of it, and it's just fabulous. So. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we've we reached out about four people who've read it. I mean, you know, the majority of them have Jungian backgrounds and, mm-hmm. you know, getting the same, you know, positive reviews from all. So, I mean, you know, it'd be great when an agent... <laughs> Uh, any literary agents listening to the podcast because you know hey here again in all honesty in all honesty and modesty you know we got something special you know and it works absolutely it works wherever we go it it works I mean we got some pretty cool things on the plate right now with Salome and Mentor Agility sorry to teach classes through Mentor Agility as a coach's training so matter of fact I'm teaching Six separate myths from, from mentor agility. Uh, each myth, each each session is uh, four four weeks, nine uh, hour, forty five minutes. But I'm doing six different myths for them. Mm-hmm. But this is for coaches trained so they can get their CEUs. But yeah, so I'm gonna be that's once a week from middle of February till end of July. Mm-hmm. So we, I I got some cool things on the plate with that. So maybe we're looking to do something. And then you know I'm. Looking to do some things on my own too. So uh, mm-hmm. it's real. It's really, really great to see you firing on all cylinders, Kwame. And, well, and I don't know bringing, if I'm firing and, on all, but okay. <laughs> but, but bringing what you have to bring, you know, yeah, as, as you. Jim yeah. Hollis says, "What wants to come into the world through you?" Yeah, and yeah. you have brought something really special into the world and are offering it widely. I, I, I also loved what you said. Just want to go back to it, where you asked yourself, sort of, and I'm paraphrasing here, "What is that I want?" Not not what's possible. That is such an important moment in life. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I find this with people that I work with where you, where you sort of say, you know, so much of, um, I want to say, growth or individuation has to do with desire. And the people that I've worked with that I was most worried about, the thing that just makes my blood run cold in the clinical setting is when someone doesn't want anything. When someone has no desire, that just, that's a kind of, then we're very close to death. Yes, yes. And, and so I'll ask people a lot, you know, sort of what is it you want? 
And there can really, in some people, be a kind of poverty of imagination. Because they'll tell me sort of what they what they want from among the options that are immediately in front of them. And what I want them to do is what you did for yourself. It's like, okay, but if the sky were the limit, mm-hmm. if it wasn't just um, a, a, the, the couple of things on the menu, but you could dream up whatever you want, what would it be? Not that we can always have that thing, but darn, we better start there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's, uh, we really stress that in alchemy, like a lot of times in the myths, uh, the, uh, like in the, in the myth of uh, the white snake, this boy is granted whatever wish he wants, okay? And so then we'll have them go around a circle, right down, what it is, you know, that you want. If you can have anything, you know, it's got to be within reach, you know, somewhat. It, it has to be something you can actually pull off. OK, I mean, you can't be <laughs> that I want to be, you know, Tom Brady. It, it, you know, <laughs> it has to be something, you know, not to say you can't be Tom Brady, but but, you know, let's be a little more realistic, you know, to hear them go around and say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. Because, you know, another quote is where you sit in your old age is determined by where you stand as a youth. So we and the, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So we try to just get them in the habit of, you know, mm-hmm. doing the right thing, doing something every day, blah, blah, blah. But wow, every man, it seems to never fail yeah. that you'll have one person who will not his imagination. You know, he will not pick anything. It's just like, man, like you say, that is that is sad. Now, now the flip side. Flip side, while we romanticize and all this, okay, uh, they say it's only two tragedies in life. One is to not get your heart's desire, and the other is to get it. All right, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's just be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. All right, well, so it all comes at a cost. yeah, it all yeah, without a doubt, it all comes yeah. at a cost. Yeah. But- you know, it seems to me um, you're talking, both of you, about uh, inner fire mm-hmm. yeah. of, of what I want today in this world, what I can do, and uh, getting in touch with that rather than um, concretizing it of, you know, wanting, wanting to be a film star or Tom Brady or something. It's not about not just about that. It's coming alive in, in your own self and then hooking that up to what's possible in the world. And we we do have to live day by day. And um, so you start. It seems to me that's what you're really teaching these young men is start now. There you go. There you start go. now. Turn, turn yourself on. Start. Come on. There um, you go. And the river of life will take you somewhere. There you go. There you go. Without a doubt, uh, start now. Um, yeah. They saying just do something every day. Yeah. You know that's going to get you. You know where you want to go. Like in, in the myth of the killing virtue, this lying cup puts his paw print in the paw prints of his mother every day, and he says, "One day I will be strong enough." And it's like you know, like we tell him, it's like you're looking at grass; you can't see it grow, but over a period of time, you know. It grows. And so like we tell them uh, from book uh, Laws of the Spirit, Dan Milman says within a 10 year period, you can pretty much accomplish anything. You know, so as mm. humans, we very seldom fail. We merely stop trying. Lisa, mm-hmm. I got my first edit uh, and I got Tom Brady in mind because I was watching the game last night. But <laughs> not, not to have him grow up to be Tom Brady, but grow up to be LeBron James from Akron, okay. Ohio. All right. That's my first edit. <laughs> which you don't have to edit i think it'd be cool just to even say that so that's like the second chance in life yeah, absolutely, yeah, second absolutely. one of the other things i i so appreciate that you said is life is so much about making decisions i look at uh, <laughs> i got a buddy uh one of my two best friends and uh, while wow, we've been friends 40 years And uh, we often talk. We've been through a lot together. That's why we know we're friends. Uh, But, man, just looking at where he is now. And, it's you know, it's just what you'll see is like a lot of times people, for lack of a better word, succeed because they because they've taken a chance. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, 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 you know, I took a chance by going to Pacifica. Like I said, hell, people like, what you going to do with a degree in myth? They say the birds that fly the highest don't fly with the flock. Uh, they say mm. he who, who, he who was seen dancing was thought to be crazy by those of whom could not hear the music. Okay. So, yeah. So you got to step out there, you know, you gotta dance when you yeah. hear the music. Yeah. Yeah. You got to step out there and take that chance, you know, leap and then the net will appear. Okay. Mm. So yeah, yeah. yeah you got to step out there and hopefully, you know, you know, hopefully things would be cool. If you persevere, you know, if you persevere, you don't give up. It might take you longer than what you expected, but <clears throat> if you really make the necessary sacrifices and you don't give up, and you and another thing we focus on a lot is uh, doing good deeds. Okay, mm-hmm. common theme and myth. You know, you do good. You, you you do a good deed. Your good deed will not go unnoticed. For one good deed deserves another. So it's just you know treating people right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It seems like we're talking about being in right relationship with the self. It seems like we're really talking a lot about yeah. this ego self axis, which is something we've mentioned before in the podcast. And, and that's what happened to you when you, you read this Joseph Campbell quote and, and you asked yourself the question and you were willing to listen to the answer and follow it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I say, well, I had, you know, I had these, uh, two dreams when I was, I was trying to make the decision because it's like, how do you leave I, my son? I was married. Son was four years old. It's like, how do you leave your son, your wife and your son travel across the country once a month? And the money that it, you know, or the money that it was on cost and it'd be different if I was getting a degree from Harvard, you know, to be a medical doctor, but you getting a degree in myth. What in the hell <laughs> are you going to do with a degree in myth? But uh, so I paid close attention to my dreams First two dreams well, that I recall, first two dreams I had, the one was a beautiful black woman sitting in, a, in like in a long chair. And I was going into this place with my father and the Dr. Fried man who got me the graduate assistantship, who recognized something in me I didn't even recognize in myself. And we went through this turnstile and then she was sitting in this chair. She had blue jeans on, beautiful woman. I could tell she was an anima archetype from me studying Jung. I picked up a phone. And I was calling her at her home. Well, obviously she wasn't at her home because she's sitting in the chair. I asked her, where did she live? And she said, I used to live in Santa Barbara. Okay, Pacifica. And then the second dream I had here again, the anima archetype. I mean, when I'm at Pacifica. It was the first day. It was the first day of class. And it was a ritual where you would dance and the people would come to the center of the, of the room and you would touch fingers. And then there was this young white woman who selected me and she was like the most beautiful woman in the room from an animal perspective. And she, she selected me. And then we came to the center of the room uh, on, on, on the gym floor, but then our fingers didn't touch. And then it was like lunchtime and we were supposed to go get a ring for that person. So those were two of the dreams. Uh, but then my third dream, and I'm just telling these because you talking about dreams, how you talk about dreams and then my third I had more dreams than that, but but the third dream was really the dream that God kept sending me signs. Okay, right. <laughs> go, go, go. But then this third dream, that this last dream while I was just a ticket, it was uh, I had a dream that it was my cousin's birthday. She's like my second cousin, beautiful person. And we would only see her like at family union meeting, but she lived right down the street. But wow, her and I would always connect. I had a dream that it was her birthday. I wake up the next day. I go to work. And this was in April. I go to work. There's a message on my on my phone, my office machine. My nickname is Cowboy. All my cousins call me Cowboy. Everybody I grew up with call me Cowboy still to, do to this day. And she said, Cowboy, I'm calling to wish you happy birthday. My birthday is in February. My birthday, February wow. 22nd. She wow. is calling me in April to say, Cowboy, I'm calling to wish you happy birthday. So then it hit me. I'm like, wow, I had a dream about her last night. That was her birthday. So I, so I looked up her number because I never called her work. I called her, left her message because she didn't answer. I'm like, Debbie, my birthday's in February, but I said I had a dream about you last night. No, 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 I I, I did talk to her. I I said, but I had a dream about you last night. So she looked up the number for birthday so she could play the number. And uh, she read me the number for birthday. The number for birthday is one, two, three. My office number, my office number is one, two, three. Okay. Wow. I'm like, come on. Okay. <laughs> come on. Okay. And so it was Hollis to say, I remember I was one of Hollis's workshops and somebody asked him, how do you know when you're 
following the right path. And he said he doesn't know, but he said what he does know, you have more synchronistic events, Yeah, you know, so while I had that. And then even with those dreams and different synchronistic events, I'm still trying to convince myself, is this the right thing to do? Like I say, I'm traveling across the country, degree in myth, leaving my family. So I'm, I'm sitting in my office and it was time to make a decision because the semester is going to start. And I, I'm leaning over my office chair and I just asked myself, what, you know, what should I do? And a cloud, an image of a cloud showed in my office with my grandmother's face, with a smiley face. And it just said, go. Oh, yeah, God. it said, go. Yeah. So, yeah. And so you were, were being supported by the ancestors. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 my ancestors, please. Uh, I'm a little ancestor. Every night I say a prayer to the creator and my ancestors. Yeah, my ancestors have my back. Oh, big time, big gosh. time. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm blessed beyond measure. I just want to really um, lift up a little more how important support is. The support that can come from within through synchronicities and uh, the ancestors. And uh, what you mentioned a little while ago of people around you who could recognize in you what you hadn't yet recognized in yourself. Uh, that we need all that kind of support. Yes, that's uh, Wild and Mead's book, uh, Firebird, talks about it's not just enough. This king kept me, and, and the second myth we do with the youth is the firebird. Okay, I lived off Michael Mead's work for like seven years. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I read that book. Yeah, Gosh. I read that book four and a half times, purchased that book for over 170 some people. I had their names in the book. Okay, I keep eight, wow, I keep eight of the books on my shelf because. <laughs> Because when I was trying to make up my mind to go to Pacifica, I had eight books of his. I have five here, three here, okay, in a dream. So I keep eight books of his mm -hmm. right there on the top, okay. Great. But anyway, second myth we do as a firebird, and, and this, this king, he recognizes the genius in this boy. So he keeps pushing the boy past his limits, keeps pushing the boy past his limits. And then me just saying that it's just, it's not enough for us to you got to have both you got to have the inside where you know that you can do it but you have to have someone on the outside recognize it and if not enough that's it's not enough you have someone on the outside recognize it if you don't recognize it on the inside you know so yeah man that's uh that's the second myth and and here again this king keeps pushing this boy past his limit but we we use that myth so that we can tell him I'm, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty hard on the youth, pretty hard on them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I tell them I'm hard on them because I recognize the genius within them. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just remarkable what that program does for these young men. I mean, Deb and I have both met them because we were lucky enough to attend yes. the screenings of the film. And what struck me from speaking with them is, you know. They, they're initiated. They know why they're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the quality of presence of just uh, groundedness and being in, in themselves and a kind of inner knowing of who they are was remarkable and what I think every parent would want for a child, male or female, uh, really such a quality of consciousness. Kwame, you said not just when we're young, and that's also something that Michael <laughs> Mead says mm -hmm. in the book Water of Life, is that we're constantly being initiated. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So so you didn't you didn't miss your chance if you're in, in fact midlife is another important time when we once again faced a, a, an initiatory descent to many of us. And so I'm thinking that your your group would that that's about to start running would just yeah. be tremendously um, valuable for for middle age. Yeah. 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 Can like say around that age of what, 40, 45 when you uh, I don't think it's really ever too late. Now, I mean, once you get, you know, with all due respect, 85, <laughs> you know, it's, it's according to what you're trying to do. It's according to what yeah. you're trying to do. Yeah. But but I mean, you know, what Jung says, well, too, you know, that's uh, that, that second half of life because you've got you know, a lot of the things, family type things taken care of. So now you can go yeah. out and, you know, yeah, so on. And it's just, it, it is, like you say, one sentence changed my entire life. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know if it can 
happen to me, you know, it can happen to you. Uh, they say that, that, that uh, you're talking about myths. Uh, they say myths are not just for putting children to sleep, but for waking adults up. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. That's really beautiful. And here, and here again, you know, the power. One of the reasons why I started using it was because uh, it's just, you know, what I'm man. I was quote unquote counseling primarily black male youth, and it was pulling teeth getting to talk. And it's just natural to become defensive if somebody's telling you you're doing something wrong. We'll put all of the information in the show notes. We'll link to your. Website will link to the documentary, will link to alchemy, and will link to um, the program, Men of Mythology. And uh, you mentioned a couple of books, and maybe we'll try to stick those in the show notes as well. Appreciate you asking me to, to do this. Sure. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Our dream for this week is from a woman who is 38 years old, and she is an artist's assistant. And here's the dream. I am in an enormous old building with a male friend. We are on a trip in a Middle Eastern, South Asian, or Northern African country. And this building houses a huge market full of people, goods, and activity. We, however, are in a big, dusty storage junk room, and there is no one else there. The ceilings are extremely high, and light fills the room from windows near the top. The room is a pleasant, warm color, and I feel contented. We aren't doing anything in particular and have no agenda. I have no problems, questions, or desires. My friend goes into an adjoining room that is also very large and stores old, forgotten stuff, but it's completely dark. I can only make out the body of a dead man on a table and can only see his feet, which have a mummified appearance. My friend approaches the body, which surprises and somewhat alarms me. He reaches out and removes the tag from its toe. He flings it toward me while bent over with laughter. I turn away and the tag lands on the back of my left shoulder. I'm aware that we don't know the cause of death and think there could be smallpox on the tag for all we know. I'm not scared, though, just a bit disgusted and very annoyed. For context, the dreamer says that she's starting to believe that a more normal life might become possible as COVID vaccinations have begun. And she says that the man in the dream and she dated for a few years, and he's been in her quarantine bubble. Uh, They still have a strong attachment and haven't moved on to new relationships. Um, although she's got some conflict about this and thinks she might be able to begin dating soon. And she also adds that she told her friend about the dream. And while hearing about the dead body in the tag, he was again overtaken by the laughter, although he tried to resist it. This matched up with the figure of him in the dream, uh, who also uh, was consumed with laughter. So... Uh, these are some curious images. I think uh, I'll start at the top, which is a good place to start when you don't know what else to do. Uh, there's this market that's full of people and it's full of energy and there's lots of activity and, and bustle. Um, so that's uh, that's interesting. But she with her companion is in a big dusty storage junk room and there's no one else there. 
So immediately there's this contrast between this kind of marketplace, which is full of life, Mm-hmm. And this almost kind of cozy, well, I guess it's it's huge, so cozy is the wrong word. But but there is a an almost kind of womb-like sense in mm-hmm. this large room. That's a, a sense for me of a kind of stasis uh in the storage junk room that every because that's where things are up on shelves or in boxes. And the contrast between the bustle of the marketplace, uh, which is Basically, you know, in a place very far away, Middle Eastern, South Asian, North African, some place that is foreign to her. Well, except we don't know where the dreamer's from. <laughs> okay, so. fair enough. Um, although I would say, you know, my feeling is that it's um, uh, somebody in a Western country, mm-hmm. but your point is well taken. Um, but the contrast with the bustle and then this quiet and deadness. And and for her, she has no problems, questions, or desires. So her internal life is quiet as well. The distinction between, wow, what's happening outside, and you are in a dusty storage junk room. Yeah. Okay? And, then, and then you aren't, and it's not... That you had no problems, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. no agenda, and no questions. Okay. 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 It's a pleasant, warm color, and she feels contented. So, is she? Is, is there a way that she's a little bit anesthetized, perhaps? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 What are you thinking, Kwame? What's your imagination? Ooh, uh, <laughs> I think it's kind of obvious, but okay. Go ahead, say it. <laughs> So maybe she's feeling too, almost like kind of too safe in her current situation. Yeah. And and hey, let's call it projection. Let's call it all projection. What I'm getting ready to say, this is all projection. I'm taking the responsibility. If it was me and I'm looking, I'm holding on to something that needs to be let go. Yeah. 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 I think, I I think that's, Mm -hmm. that's possible. Yeah. Here again, that's projection. Right. And we, we always say on the podcast, you know, we're, yeah. it's, it's sort of an example of how we might work with the dream. And there's, yeah. you know, we can't claim yeah. any particular authority to, to anything that we're offering. But, um, you know, I, it is curious that, that she says, I have no questions or desires. And we, we were just talking about that and the kind, the kind of lack of desire and how desire is often what propels us forward in life. So then the friend goes into the adjoining room. And uh, and I guess this is this male friend, so kind of an anonymous figure, perhaps, kind of leading her into the depths, mm-hmm. which is what the anonymous does. And here's a room that stores old, forgotten stuff, and it's totally dark. So this is really an image of the unconscious. I mean, in fact, a storage room that holds forgotten stuff is just about a perfect analogy for the unconscious. And there is a dead man on a table. And it looks like he's been there for quite some time since his feet have a mummified appearance. Uh, so this seems to indicate, hmm, you know, what, what is there in the dark, in the unconscious, that's been forgotten, <laughs> or seemingly so, uh, that's, that's here now? Uh, so has come back. You know, it's something pretty ancient, and perhaps it's been carefully preserved. And then, and then him throwing that tag away, which, which is what identifies the body. And then it's funny to him, but it ain't mm-hmm. funny to her. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The tag is, is the identifier, um, but it hits her in the back. Uh, on her left side, which is uh, sometimes associated especially with uh, the unconscious, since most of us have our right hand dominant. But uh, it's still an image of something that hits her, um, but in her own unconscious. It's, she's not able to read this tag. It's not helpful, and it's just flung at her. Well, I, I'm I'm thinking about it a little bit differently. I see the male friend as kind of a trickster figure mm-hmm. because he does something that's really irreverent to take the tag off the toe, and then he, you know, feels like this is hilarious. And we know that trickster energy can break up 
conscious energy that's become too one-sided or too stuck. And so I wonder if it's not a very important thing that he does this irreverent thing. Yeah. And it's interesting because she's worried about the tag maybe containing smallpox. And there is this way that he, the, the dream figure and then the waking figure as well, are kind of overcome with this hilarity about it, which which can actually be contagious. You know, that, that sense when you kind of get the giggles and you can't stop laughing. Um, so there's this almost fear of contagion. And, and I wonder if her getting hit in the, the back uh, on the left side um, isn't, isn't something that, that ca she kind of needs to be hit. She sort of needs to be, mm -hmm. she, needs a, she needs to be, uh, have a little laughter, <laughs> perhaps. Well, she, she needs something really attention getting, and it seems really transgressive. Yes, you know, that anybody would do this to a corpse and and be so irreverent. Um, but it may be that that's what's needed to get her attention. Yeah, to awaken her. Why, why are you talking? I think yeah, she needs to be awakened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the the contrast in the dream ego's feelings versus our trickster character is really remarkable. She says she's a bit disgusted and annoyed. Um, which is a real contrast with this other dream figure with his laughter. And both of those, of course, are images of parts of her, parts of the dreamer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my question would be, if she were here, to say, what is trying to get your attention? Yeah, and, and the, the trickster figure, trickster slash animus figure, has a very different attitude to the attitude of the dream ego and seems to be bringing something new, something perhaps compensatory to the conscious attitude mm -hmm. of um, irreverence and, and hilarity that seems, like you said, Deb, transgressive. Yeah. I'm taking this back to the first part of the dream as well, where she is in this uh, contented place in the quiet, dusty storage room, and she has no problems, questions, or desires. Uh, f the difference between that kind of stasis and calm, and now all of a sudden a kind of awakening into, ooh, you know, what if there's smallpox on the tag, uh, uh, the disgust and uh, annoyance. So she's now activated right. in a way that she wasn't, uh, at the beginning, you know, even though she, the very first part of the dream is she's on a trip in these um, Middle Eastern, South Asian, North African countries. So usually when we're on a trip, we're taking an interest in everything that we see. Uh, you know, as I was saying too, what resonated with me that the ceilings are extremely high and light fills the room from the windows near the top. Just, man, the potential that is there. You know, the potential, so much potential. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.